there was a little girl who loved fairy tales. Lotte wandered through deep forests, spying witches and wolves. She danced with princesses. She met a frog that was really a prince, and she spun straw into gold. There was magic and adventure everywhere. On every page she turned. And when she was finally exhausted and lay down for a nap, Grimm's fairy tale slept too, its characters frozen in the precise moment the book was closed, waiting to come to life again. Lotte craved stories like other children craved iced gingerbread. Her parents and grandparents read to her for hours on end. She was their only child and grandchild, and they invested all their hopes in her future happiness. Though Lotte wasn't a fairy tale princess, she was their princess. They read and read until she started to read all by herself. But Lotte did not live in a fairy tale land of long ago. She was born on June 2nd, 1899, in Germany's largest city, Berlin. And as she grew, so did her country, with life-changing new technologies. If you gazed down to Knesebeck Street below the Reiniger family's small apartment, a prince more likely traveled by car than by storybook steed. All over Europe, factory smokestacks shot up as fast as giant beanstalks above the ancient pine forests. Lotte had the best of both worlds. She was a modern girl who loved traditional tales. And one of her very favorite new technologies was the movies. Her grandmother often took her to the cinema. Lotte especially loved to lose herself in the fantasy films of French director Georges Méliès. Around 1906, they went to see his A Trip to the Moon. At this time, movies were silent, so a real orchestra would play along with the movie. Just imagine the clash of cymbals as the rocket landed splat in the moon's eye. Milies made fantasy stories look and sound believable, transporting the audience to a different world. One day, Lotte was given a gift that would transform her from a reader and a viewer of stories into a teller of stories. Chinese puppets allowed Lotte to physically perform her beloved fairy tales. Like a fairy casting a spell with her wand, Lotte flicked her wrist and brought the sleeping puppets to life. Swooping down low, stretching up high, she led them in a dance around the room. At school, Lotte learned the traditional craft of Scherenschnitte, which means scissor cuts. She quickly learned that she could create her own magical paper cut characters from a simple piece of paper. She snipped away for hours, turning the paper this way and that, until she was left with silhouettes and a tiny pile of paper snow. But Lotte soon became frustrated with her still paper cuts. She wanted them to move and come alive. Inspired by her Chinese puppets, she turned the paper cuts into puppets. Using heavier paper, she connected body parts with wire hinges, mimicking real, fluid movements. At the age of 12, she made her own theater from old cardboard boxes. She started to stage plays in her living room, like Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. But Lotte wanted a bigger audience. 
everyone. As Lotte grew, so did her fascination with cinema. Already bowled over by Milliez's work, she started to enjoy German movies, especially those starring the actor Paul Wegner. Wegner was very famous, but he wasn't exactly your typical handsome film star. A giant of a man at six and a half feet tall, he loved to play the roles of monsters and mad scientists. He also directed his own movies and led a troupe of actors. Lotte was his greatest fan. One day in April 1916, at the age of 17, Lotte set off to attend his lecture, New Goals of Cinema. She entered the theater and sat down. Vigna started to speak. We are entering a new pictorial fantasy world as we would enter a magic forest. Vigna spoke with passion especially about animation. He believed that animation could be used to see before our very eyes a world of pure fantasy come to life. Lotte was in awe. She didn't want to just watch movies. She wanted to make them. She raced home and pleaded with her parents to let her study acting at the nearby school where Vigna's troupe was based. She dreamed she might become part of that exciting circle of artists. These were her people. Lotte bloomed at the school. Acting helped build her confidence. When out of class, she sat and observed Vigna's troupe. Sometimes she was given small roles in his plays and movies, but more often she would take paper and scissors and create silhouettes of the actors. In return, the troupe would observe her, spellbound by her talent, and they bought the paper cuts. That money helped her pay for her tuition and rent. Her tiny, clever snips of paper magically made cash appear. She had the smart idea of creating many, many paper cuts of Vigna. She knew this would both flatter him and reveal her talent. And sure enough, Vigna noticed her. Excited to discover Lotte's remarkable gift, Vigna asked her to join his film crew. He took Lotte under his mighty wings as her mentor. One of her first jobs was to make intertitles for his latest movie, The Mountain Spirit's Wedding. Intertitles were used in the early days of movies because sound in cinema hadn't been invented yet. Intertitles described speech, a change of scene, a loud noise, Boom! Impressed by her hard work and enthusiasm, Vigna asked Lotte to assist in more films, to design sets, special effects, and costumes. She proved herself to be an essential part of Vigna's film crew. Then one day, he asked her to work on something special. Something difficult. Some animation. The Pied Piper of Heimannen is the tale of a town plagued by rats. It's a horrific fairy tale, so of course Vigna wanted to make it into a movie. He took the main role as the piper. In the story, 
The piper leads the rats of Hamelin away with his hypnotic flute melody. When the townsfolk refuse to pay the piper, he lures the town's children away to disappear forever. Ready to shoot a scene, Lotte hid out of view of the camera with the other crew members. Each crew member had a basket of rats. At the signal, a gunshot fired, and the crew released the rats into the street, but the rats ran away. The rats didn't magically follow Vigna. They disappeared into the town, plaguing the townsfolk. Next, the crew tried guinea pigs, painted gray with tails attached. A gunshot was fired into the air. The camera whirred. The guinea pigs were released. Vigna turned to see the little creatures in the middle of the street, chewing their fake tails off. So, how to create the magic of hypnotized rats following the piper? Vigna asked Lotte to create an animation. Her first. The technique she would use is called stop-motion animation. Using wooden rats, she would convey rats scuttling, scampering, pouring into the streets, a river of rodents drawn to their deaths. And this is how she did it. One morning, she and the other crew members hid again along the street, this time each with a basket of wooden rats. At the signal, they moved the rats onto the street. The movie camera took one shot, called a frame, like a single photograph. Then the rats were moved again, a tiny amount, incrementally, and another frame was shot. With Lotte's direction, this process was repeated many, many thousands of times. It was painstaking work, requiring great patience. Shooting the frames took all day. 24 frames equal one second of movie. But when the thousands of frames were run together and combined with footage of Vigna prancing along playing the pipe, their hard work was complete. At the cinemas, audiences loved the Pied Piper of Heimalen, and especially Lotte's rat sequence. By creating this animation, Lotte had become a sorcerer. She had brought the wooden rats to life and enchanted audiences with her animation magic. The movie played for over 40 weeks on the German cinema circuit. Wegner was pleased with Lotte's work. He decided to introduce her to some important people. Wegner introduced Lotte to Hans Kohles and Karl Koch, the directors of a new animation studio. Lotte was offered a job, and she eagerly accepted it. Karl showed Lotte how to use an important piece of animation equipment, the Tricktisch, Trick Animation Table. She began by making several animations with Karl. Before long, she started to work on her own story using her silhouettes. She created a plot. She drew a storyboard showing sketches of key moments in her five-minute-long animation. She cut and hinged characters. And she sat at the Tricktisch for hours on end, making incremental movements as Karl shot each frame from above. The film was then dyed with special ink to make the animation colorful. The Tricktisch. Cameras fixed above table. Rectangle of glass set in table. The area to be shot. Light from below. Her short film was titled The Ornament of the Loving Heart. Das Ornament des Verliebten Herzens.
Audiences loved it. Lotte decided to dedicate her life to animation. Her dream of bringing stories to life and entertaining everyone was starting to come true. Between 1918 and 1926, after the success of The Ornament of the Loving Heart, Lotte's work flowed like a reel of film. She created fairy tales such as Cinderella and short cinema advertisements for ink, chocolate, and skin products. All were created with the help of Ka. She was the artist, he was the technician. They happily worked together in friendship and with great respect for each other's talents. And they also fell in love. They were married on December 6, 1921, four years after they first met. And though they would live happily ever after, like a fairy tale princess and her prince charming, they still had work to do and stories to tell. Latte wanted to create more convincing animations by getting a feel for a creature's movement in her bones. When not at the studio working with Ka, she attended the ballet and visited the Berlin Zoo. Observing the animals and copying them, Lotte would attract an audience of giggling children. She didn't mind one bit. Then one day in 1923, a handsome stranger arrived at the Institute. He approached Lotte and Karl. His name was Louis Hagen, a wealthy banker and arts patron. He had an idea. He wanted to know if Lotte would make a full-length silhouette animation film. This had never been done before. Lotte later said, Animated films were supposed to make people roar with laughter, and nobody had dared entertain an audience with them for more than ten minutes. She felt unsettled, muddled by both excitement and worry. Lotte had always dreamed of making a longer movie, but it simply cost too much. At the time, there was widespread poverty in Germany. But Hagen had invested in a huge amount of unused film. And, because this was a most depressing era for most Germans, Hagen thought that they would want to escape real life at the movies. It was an offer she could not refuse. Lotte chose to take her viewers on a journey away from Germany, inspired by 1001 Arabian Nights. The tales collected in this volume drew from many different storytelling traditions, including Arabic, Turkish, Greek, Jewish, Indian, and Persian. Lotte decided to weave together several stories for maximum fantasy. There would be flying horses, evil sorcerers, witches and demons, explosions and storms, all great subjects for experimenting with special effects. The title would be The Adventures of Prince Ahmed. Louis Hagen offered her a studio an attic above a garage at his country home. Lotte hired four animators to help with her massive endeavor. Lotte, Karl, and their team moved to Potsdam to work on the film. There was so much for Lotte to do. She created a story outline and character sketches. Then she made storyboards. Each animator was given specific tasks and encouraged to experiment with anything the team could afford. The cheapest of household materials, soap, paint, sand, and wax, 
would be used to create the most magical special effects. She also hired a composer named Wolfgang Zella to create a musical score to play along with the movie. She created her characters and background landscapes using thin lead and often old diaper boxes. Most of the time, she knelt on an old car seat, which she found most comfortable. And of course, she had to spend many long hours making tiny incremental movements of her characters as Kyle shot each frame. Lotte had to juggle many different things. Lotte's previous animations were beautiful, but quite flat in appearance. To make the background appear more distant, Lotte figured she could use a trick tish with many glass plates, not just one, stacked below the camera. Such a camera would add a great sense of depth to her fantasies, and with this many-layered, super-tall trick tish, multiple animators could work at the same time. As such a thing did not exist, Lotte had to invent it. Her invention became known as the world's first multi-plane camera. The team worked hard, putting in long days in their tiny workspace. Sometimes, Lotte was weighed down by doubts. She worried that an audience wouldn't sit through an hour-long animated movie, that she'd taken on too much, that she'd fail. But with Ka's support and her hard determination, she carried on. Finally, after three years of living and breathing the adventures of Prince Ahmed, the movie was finished. The movie was 65 minutes long. They had shot 250,000 frames, of which 96,000 were used. Like many artists who commit to a lengthy process, they feared no one would show up to the premiere. They handwrote over 8,000 invitations to get the word out, and they prepared themselves for disappointment. Premiere of The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, Sunday, May 2nd, 1926, Volksbühne Theater, Berlin. The big day arrived. Lotte awoke disappointed to see the sun shining. Surely, after a hard winter, folks would want to be outside, not in a dark cinema. As she and Kyle approached the theater, they were shocked to see a long line of people. Pushing through the crowds inside, Lotte saw Zella warming up his orchestra. She watched as arguments broke out over seats. People filled the aisles and grew restless waiting. At last, the adventures of Prince Ahmed lit the screen. The Abenteuer des Prinzen Ahmed. audience was hooked. that the police arrived, worried about the crowd's safety. But Lotte persuaded them to let the show go on.
As the movie reached its grand finale, Lotte noticed smoke bellowing up the screen. The audience thought it was a special effect and was not frightened. Lotte raced around looking for the fire and discovered sacks that had been left dry on heaters were smoldering. The cinema crew hadn't noticed. They were too absorbed in the movie. When the film ended, the crowd went wild with appreciation. With her dream come to life, Lotte stepped out of the shadows and took a bow. The Adventures of Prince Ahmed took its place in film history as the first full-length fairy tale movie. It is also considered the oldest surviving full-length animation. For a young woman in 1926, this is a remarkable, almost unbelievable achievement. But all of this is true, and absolutely not a fairy story. Lotte would go on to make many, many more movies, and to have many more adventures with Kahl. Future animators would be greatly inspired by her pioneering work, her unique silhouette style, and her mesmerizing, magical movies. So, let us now end her story so she can enjoy a nap in her palace of imagination. Lotte Reinecke, the queen of animation, is always waiting for you to revisit. Lotte led a full, fascinating life. It was difficult to contain all her adventures, so I focused on her experiences, art, and innovations that led up to the adventures of Prince Ahmed. Here's a little of what happened to Lotte subsequently. After the premiere in Berlin, the adventures of Prince Ahmed had its French premiere in Paris in 1926, where she met the famous French director Jean Renoir, Lotte, Karl, and Renoir became great friends, and Karl frequently worked on technical aspects of Renoir's movies. The iconic German director Fritz Lang, who had attended the Berlin premiere, was also impressed by Lotte's talent and asked her to create an animation for his pioneering science fiction movie, Metropolis, 1927. Throughout Germany in the 1920s and 30s, a political storm was brewing. The Nazi party rose to power, whose doctrines both Lotte and Karl opposed. They decided to leave their country in 1935. Many of their Jewish friends and colleagues, including composer Wolfgang Zella, had already fled to avoid persecution and imprisonment. Lotte and Karl went to England, France, and Italy, working in each country until their visas ran out then moving on to the next. In September 1939, Great Britain, France, and Poland declared war on Germany after the Germans invaded Poland. World War II had begun. In December 1943, Lotte received the news that her mother, still living in Berlin, was seriously ill, partly due to a food shortage. So Lotte and Karl returned to look after her although they were afraid for their lives. Lotte was forced to start work on an animation for the regime, which she did reluctantly and as slowly as possible, so it couldn't be completed. She was paid with a meager amount of food vouchers to survive on. During the Battle of Berlin, she hid in a basement and an underground shaft as the city crumbled. She hung paper cuts in local bookshops for friends to see, to show that she was still alive. World War II ended in 1945. In 1949, Lotte and Karl moved to the United Kingdom. 
Both of them suffered from exhaustion and illness due to malnutrition from the war, Kyle especially. They began their new lives making animations for the General Post Office and the BBC. Lotte's stop frame animations greatly inspired the work of the BBC's remarkable, much-loved early childhood animations of the 1950s and 60s. After a few years, Lotte and Karl came across an old friend, Louis Hagen's son, also named Louis Hagen, who was a refugee in London. Louis decided to set up an animation production company for them in 1952. It was named Primrose Productions. Louis Hagen Jr. gave Lotte a new trick and set up a studio in London. She created 13 animations for American television by 1954, and this became the most productive period of her life. In 1962, Lotte and Karl became British citizens, but Karl never recovered from the malnutrition he had suffered in the 1940s, and in 1963, he died. Lotte said, It is terrible my husband is gone, because you cannot imagine a better partner in the world. Lotte withdrew from the world and stopped animating, only occasionally advising on her old love, puppetry. Lotte stepped out of the shadows of grief slowly. By the 1970s, her animations were being revived, and people took great interest in her technique and achievements. She began touring the world, giving talks on her career. She wrote an excellent book, Shadow Puppets, Shadow Theaters, and Shadow Films, 1970, which included instructions on making many useful things, including a trictish. And she continued her animations, the last being The Four Seasons in 1980. On June 19, 1981, while staying with friends in Tübingen, Germany, Lotte died in her sleep. She is buried in Dettenhausen, Germany, next to her beloved Karl. But Lotte's legacy lives on in the many homages that grateful animators have made to her and her work. In Fantasia, 1940, a silhouetted Mickey Mouse is interspliced with live-action musicians, a reference to Lotte's technique. The 2004 movie Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events mimics Lotte's style in its credits. In The Tale of the Three Brothers sequence, in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, Part 1, 2010, her influence can clearly be seen. The director and creator of the animated television series Steven Universe, Rebecca Sugar, made an homage to Lotte in the episode The Answer, 2016. Sugar said, A lot of Steven Universe crew members were hugely inspired by Lotte Reinecke's work. Please be aware that The Adventures of Prince Ahmed was intended for adult viewing. At this time in history, animated movies were not specifically created for children. Lotte's movie contained some frightening, violent, and sexual scenes, and her heroes and heroines comply to the gender stereotypes of the time and to the stories on which they were based. Her movie can also be viewed as an example of Orientalism. This is the exaggerated, imagined Western depiction of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and East Asian cultures, resulting in stereotyping and exoticism. Later in the 1950s, recognizing the harmfulness of stereotypes, Lotte changed the way she interpreted different ethnicities. The Ornament of the Loving Heart, 1919. Cinderella, 1922. Puss in Boots, 1934. Thumbelina, 1955. There's a short documentary film by Primrose Productions called The Art of Lotte Reinecke, 1970, that I thoroughly recommend, especially for young animators. 
In it, Lotte shows her sketches, storyboards, characters, and her masterful, super speedy scissor technique. It is also wonderful to hear her jolly, down-to-earth voice. At one point, she advises animators to cut a hole in their dining room table to make their own trick tish. Institutions holding examples of Lotte's art, artifacts, and archives. British Film Institute, London, UK. Film Museum Düsseldorf, Düsseldorf, Germany. Max Reinhardt Archives and Library, Binghamton University, New York, USA. Stadtmuseum Tübingen, Tübingen, Germany. Please check that Lotte's work is on display before planning your trip. <laughs>